Good morning. morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor, and you can just call me Gene. That's okay. I'll get a new intro sooner or later. I just can't think of anything else that's better. My name comes up on the screen, doesn't it? Maybe I don't even need to do it. So anyway, I'll just move right along, adding time to the sermon, which we don't need to do. (laughs) So here's the thing. In good teaching, if you've ever had to teach anybody anything at all, Good teaching is repetitive. The Bible is really repetitive. Some people have noted that. Gene, I feel like we're doing the same Bible study that we did last week. Kind of. It's repetitive. But that's good teaching. So if you ever taught anybody anything, start with the basics and you repeat the basics over and over and over and over again until you get it. So first you crawl, then you walk, then you run. If you try to run first, you don't get it. So that's the proper order. It's also repetitive. So there are some teachings or illustrations or examples that I keep coming back to. And sometimes people are like, here we go again. But don't do that because I'm going, when are you going to get it, right? So (laughs) it's both ways, guys. So I use an example throughout this whole series a lot. But here's the thing for all the where are you going, guys, I'm going to go somewhere different with it. Well, I'm going to expand on it. But... There are beginners here. Maybe some people are here new to Christianity. So I just got to explain something that you all do. They got to know about this. It's the verse of the day, Christian, do not roll your eyes. So that's like one of my pet peeves because I've given this example in the past. If you don't know this, the way Christians read their Bible, 99% of them, is kind of like watching a movie five seconds at a time. Right? So if you just did that straight through, it would take you years to finish the movie. You'd have no idea what it was all about at all. But Christians do something else. They jump all over the place. So they'll do a verse over here, then they'll do a verse at the beginning, and so they're literally scrambled up. So most Christians just say stuff, they repeat verses, and they don't know what they're talking about. They have no idea what they're saying. So if you're new, this happens, right? So you got to try to correct it a little bit because it's kind of crazy. Well, here's the thing. I'm going to build on that example for you today. So yes, it's going somewhere, thankfully, right? So... (laughs) Movie. Let's pick a movie. I decided to just make an example of how this would look if we really did this with a movie like Christians do with their Bible verses. So I went back a long time. I went back almost 30 years. So I went back 29 years. That's going to be a number. 29 years to 1993. Did I get the math right? Yes. Okay. 29 years to 1993, a movie called Alive. Starring Ethan Hawke, and he gets an E at the end of his last name because he's super cool. Now, here's the thing about Ethan Hawke. We met about 30 years ago, and here's the thing. I remember it. He does not. So moving on, (laughs) definitely not. So Alive. So if you know this movie, you're going, ooh, right? It's not a good movie. Well, it's a good movie, but it's like kind of a scary movie. You don't want to bring the kids to watch this movie. We're not going to show it on family movie day. So I'll give you the basic premise here. If you've never seen the movie, or just to remind you, because it's like 30 years ago, and I don't remember what I did last week. So here we go. (laughs) So there's like a rugby team from Uruguay, I think, and they're on a plane. They're headed to Chile for a game. Right, so they're all on the plane, they're, they're rugby play, I think it's rugby. So rugby, they're flying, and they're going over the Andes Mountains, but they're not going over the Andes Mountains, they end up going into the Andes Mountains. The plane crashes, and a whole bunch of people die. 29, I believe, people die, based on a true story, like in the 70s, 1972. So there are survivors, and they're in like the main part of the plane, but the plane is all broken up. And so they get it as warm as they can. They're in the snow, high altitude, right? So these, there's dead bodies. It's a terrible situation. Some people are unconscious. Bad. But they got to eat. So they look around for, yep, they look around for food. And what do they find? Chocolate and wine. So now if we just stop reading here, we stop watching, like, some people are like, that sounds good to me. <laughs> but they ration it. No. So they have to ration it out. There's an argument about that. Well, some time goes by, and they see an airplane, and they think that the airplane has spotted them. They're good. So what do they do? Gobble up all the chocolate and wine. Right? So <laughs> that's exactly what they do. They eat all the chocolate and wine. It's out. Here's the thing. They're not going to be rescued. 
They discover that, and it's like, uh uh-oh, what do we do? What do we eat? Now, here's the thing. Before you make these people heroes, here's the thing. You can survive without food for like 40 days, right? We can fast, and you just need water. You can't go like more than a week without water. Well, there's snow everywhere. Why don't you just, you know, there's, so anyway. So here we get to the next part. <laughs> they, there's, there's no food, but there's dead bodies. So kids, <laughs> this is going to be a little scary today. But the, so earmuffs, right? So if they can handle it, that's cool. They eat their friends. They eat the dead bodies to survive. Okay, so that's the context. We got that? Keep the context in your head. But now, like, well, <laughs> so here's this line. Here's the line we're going to use. So now they decide they got to go get help. And so Ethan Hawke's character, another guy, the other guy's kind of lazy and complaining or whatever it is. You know, I can't make it. It's 50 miles. I can't do it. So there's mountains and everything. And Ethan Hawke, he knows he has to be inspiring. Right? No problem for Ethan Hawke. He's inspiring. So <laughs> he's like, you know, look at those mountains over there. So he decides to encourage him. And he, he, I don't want to get this line wrong here. It's not a Bible line, so i got to really look at it. Look, it's magnificent. It's God. And it'll carry us over every stone. I swear. So he's kind of mixing up like a little bit of Jesus and Satan talking with each other. I don't know what he's doing there. (laughs) But but anyway, so, you know, it's an inspiring line. So here's the thing. Forget that you know the context, right? So remember to forget that you know the context. And so here's what we're going to do. We're going to pretend like you never saw the movie. You don't know the plot line. You didn't listen to me. That's totally plausible. And so, <laughs> so that, that's the mindset that you're in right now, right? But you're on the TikTok, right? You're flicking through there, and then you're like, oh, that looks like a young Ethan Hawke, because it is. And so you stop, and you play it, and you just hear that line. And you're like, I feel pretty motivated and inspired to go from, like, my bedroom to the, to the kitchen and the fridge. So that's good. It'll get me there. <laughs> so it's inspiring. So what do you do? You share it with everybody. And here's the thing. It gets 20,000 views. Unbelievable. So if you're anything like me, and this is exactly what I did on TikTok, (laughs) I pinned it to the top. Because here's the thing. I'm never going to get 20,000 views ever again. That's it. So I'm going to pin it there, try posting a few more videos. If they don't do that well, I'm out. I drop the mic. I'm out of TikTok. My excuse is that it's crazy in there. That's a true story. So now you're happy to share this video with anyone anyone who will watch it, right, because it's inspiring. No, it's because you got 20,000 views and you want everybody to see that. So you're sharing it with anyone who will watch it. Some time goes by and you find yourself, oh, here's the thing, on a plane, right? So now you're going to be on a plane, but here's the thing about the post. You did hashtag Ethan Hawk, right, and Moon Knight just came out. So that's what happened. It was pilot error. Every bad pun is intended here. So you'll get that in a minute. So you're on a plane, (laughs) and now what are you doing? There's some free time. You're flying. You're not going anywhere in Florida because there's no mountains here. So you're going to Colorado, right? Snow-capped mountains. We've got to make the story good. So snow-capped mountains, and here's the thing. You're showing everybody. Think now. You're showing everyone this post. But you're on a plane, right, going to a place with snowy mountains. And so there's some old people like me on the plane. They've seen the movie, and they're like, oh, like, that's not very, well, that's not good. I don't want to see that or think about that right now. I'm flying in a plane. Some people are nervous, and you're like, look, look at, remember what happened? You know, and this is inspiring. So now you notice someone right next to you. They're really nervous. You've, they've got the window shade down and everything. Right? They don't want to look out of a plane. They're kind of nervous. And so, you know, you want to be helpful like most Christians are. you got this inspiring thing. And so, you know, you, you turn to them and you say, hey, because you know the movie it was from. You go, have you ever seen the movie Alive? <laughs> the person's like, are you kids? This person really bringing up a movie where the plane crashes into a mountain and then people eat each other. Yes, you are. That's what you're doing, right? Because you don't know the context. This is what's happening here. So the person are not responding. You don't know why. Because you don't know the context of what you're doing. So you show them the video. <laughs> and then they're like... Ah, you know, they're bringing back 30 years of horrible memories back to mind. It doesn't work. So here's what you decide to do. You roll up the shade, and sure enough, there's a mountain in the distance. And you're like, I'm going to be Ethan Hawk right now. And so you look out, out the window, and you recite the line. Look, dramatic pause. It's magnificent. It's God. It'll carry us over every stone. 
I can't believe I remember that. I swear. I swear. Right? Now the person's like, bing bong. You know, the flight attendant it has the flight attendant. Can I move my seat? Right? Why do you want to move your seat? And by the way, they can't do that because they have to be able to like identify if the plane crashes. Why do you want to move your seat? I think he wants to eat me. <laughs> you know? So there we go. So now all that, just so that you understand why, like if you're going to quote a Bible verse, you need to know the context. You see how stupid we can look or how frightened we can make people in some cases. So here's the thing. We're in, I'll do anything. I'll do whatever it takes. We're in, <laughs> we're in the rest of the story. is where We're looking at the full context of God's word. We're looking into what's behind some of these one-liners that we're always saying. And we're seeing that like, uh-oh, maybe I should stop using that verse. We'll see it again today. So if you're totally new, here is what's going on in the background. Maybe you heard of King David, right? David and Goliath. So if we go one person, next person is son Solomon. Rich, right? And wise. Eh, not so much. Broke all God's rules for the king. That leads to punishment for Rehoboam. Then there's a civil war. Jeroboam in the north, Rehoboam in the south. So you have Judah, Israel. That's what the Bible's talking about when they say that. So Israel as a whole is later. So civil war, many, many, many kings. Kingdom of the north falls first to Assyria. Now it's Judah's turn. It's kind of a little more slow moving. Good king, bad king, good king, bad king, but then bad king, bad king, bad king. And so now that's where we are. We're at the bad kings. We had Jehoiakim. He was that dude who cut up the scroll, right? So he doesn't listen. He gets taken away by Nebuchadnezzar to Babylon. Now you have Jehoiachin, and that's where we are. 2 Kings 24, 8. Jehoiachin was 18 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem three months, some versions say, and 10 days. His mother was Nehushta, the daughter of, of Elnathan from Jerusalem. Jehoiachin did what was evil in the Lord's sight, just as his father had done. So, uh, if your Bible says Jeconiah or something like that, it's the same name. I don't know why these Bible translators do that. They just want to confuse you. Same person if your Bible says that. Now, parallel accounts. I'm going to do this fast because I've explained this before. So there are many books of the Bible, and sometimes they're giving a parallel account of the same-ish thing with some different details. It seems that in Chronicles, First and Second Chronicles, the chronicler comes along and, you know, maybe he has... For 2 Kings, a source material, but he's saying, ah, you know, I'm going to add this detail. It looks like he covers Judah in the south more, or the person who wrote it, more than whoever did First and 2 Kings. So they give us little details, like Jehoiakim getting taken away. That wasn't in 2 Kings. So these accounts are good. But today we're going to stick in 2 Kings because it gives us the info we need 2 Chronicles really doesn't give us that much more, but we also saw that prophets are weaving their way through this account. The Bible is not in chronological order, so you have to kind of rearrange it. Now, we looked at the first three chapters of Daniel, some Jeremiah, but Jeremiah gets especially confusing. So, I made you a chart. Okay, that joke is always old now. So, <laughs> I didn't draw me, we know why, but I came up with the chronological order there. So you see that Jeremiah is going to weave its way through, but the problem with Jeremiah is it's not chronological within itself. <laughs> it jumps all over the place. So it can be extremely confusing. So I'm going to try to put it kind of in order-ish for you. And there are some places when you look at it, it's not a definitely. So I put like a probably that's about where that goes. It can get very, very confusing and difficult. So Let's go to Jeremiah, where there's a prophecy about the king we're talking about, Jehoiachin. Jeremiah 22, 24. As surely as I live, says the Lord, I will abandon you, Jehoiachin, son of Jehoiakim, Kim, Kim, king of Judah. Even if you were the signet ring on my right hand, I would pull you off. I will hand you over to those who seek to kill you, those you so desperately fear, to King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon and the mighty Babylonian army. I will expel you and your mother from this land, and you will die in a foreign country, not in your native land. You will never again return to the land you yearn for. And that is exactly what happens. The prophecy comes true. 2 Kings 24.10. 
During Jehoiachin's reign, the officers of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came up against Jerusalem and besieged it. Nebuchadnezzar himself arrived at the city during the siege. Then King Jehoiachin, along with the queen mother, his advisors, his commanders, and his officials, surrendered to the Babylonians. In the eighth year of King Nebuchadnezzar's reign, he took Jehoiachin prisoner. As the Lord had said beforehand, Nebuchadnezzar carried away all the treasures from the Lord's temple and the royal palace. He stripped away all the gold objects that King Solomon of Israel had placed in the temple. King Nebuchadnezzar took all of Jerusalem captive, including all the commanders and the best of the soldiers, craftsmen, and artisans, 10,000 in all. Only the poorest people, some prophets, were left in the land. Now, if we go back to Jeremiah and try to do this chronologically, we get to chapter 23, we see that there's going to be a righteous descendant pointing to Jesus. But really, the bulk of this is just these warnings against these false prophets. So you have false prophets both places saying everything's going to be just fine. Right? It's going to be over really soon, like just a couple years or whatever. So we'll, we'll see that happening here. So they're trying to give people hope, but they're doing so falsely. It's not what God said is going to happen. So that's going on a lot in the church, right? They, it, they don't say what this says, right? So same today. So that's what's happening. A lot of the false teachers, they're doing so for prosperity usually, and that is happening in the church today. If we go to chapter 24, just an interesting thing I want to point out. So here in chapter 23, Jeremiah chapter 24, it's like the good and bad figs. And I kind of talked about this last week. And my, my wife was quick to point out, like I said, <laughs> good fruit and bad fruit. And she's good with Galatians, so she's thinking, no, that's just the flesh. There's no fruit. And I'm thinking, no, no, good figs, bad figs. So it's like good Fruit, bad fruit. You can have the fruit of the flesh, I think I was saying. But that's just like the bad figs. The idea here, just so you understand, is that these people are getting what they deserve. So remember, if you're new, you're like, God's so mean. No, these people are mean. They're really, really bad. They are, well, we'll see what they're going to do. I don't want to spoil this part. But they're killing their own children. They're sacrificing their own children to false gods. It's bad. So he's punishing them. So what he's doing is he's sending these bad people away, right, even though they're from Judah, Israelites. They're sending them away to be punished. So it's like going to be a 70-year timeout. That's basically what's happening because they're so wicked. They're evil. That's what's happening. But there are some that refuse to go, including a now puppet king put there by Nebuchadnezzar, Zedekiah. So He's no good. So he's like this puppet ruler, just a client king. As long as, you know, he pays what he should, he's going to leave him alone. So they're kind of like traitors. Think about it that way. So they're the bad figs that stay there and don't take God's punishment. The good figs, they're good, but not good enough to get out of the exile. So they're taken away to Babylonia. So that's what's happening here and the good and bad figs. So here's where Jeremiah gets really confusing. Because if you turn the page, we're in another king's reign all of a sudden. It's like, whoop, we got to go backwards again. So we have to make a jump to Jeremiah 29. That's what's happening during this time. And we're going to get some key verses here that will hang on today. Jeremiah 29.1. Jeremiah wrote a letter from Jerusalem to the elders, priests, prophets, and all the people who had been exiled to Babylon by King Nebuchadnezzar. Those are the people who have taken away. Jeremiah, maybe he's one of the poor people. He stays in Jerusalem. But he's not a bad fig. This was after King Jehoiachin, the queen mother, the court officials, and other officials of Judah, and all the craftsmen, artisans, uh, had been deported from Jerusalem. He sent the letter with Elisa, son of Shaphan, and Gemariah, son of Hilkiah, when they went to Babylon as King Zedekiah's ambassadors to Nebuchadnezzar. So the client king there is sending ambassadors to him, probably paying him money and stuff. This is what the letter said. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of Israel, says to all the captives he has exiled to Babylon from Jerusalem. Build homes and plan to stay. Plant gardens and eat the food they produce. Marry and have children. Then find spouses for them so that you may have grandchildren. Multiply. Do not dwindle away. And work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies and the God of Israel says, do not let the prophets and fortune tellers who are with you in the land of Babylon trick you. Do not listen to their dreams because they are telling you lies in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. This is what the Lord says. You will be in Babylon for 70 years, but then I will come and do for you all the good things I have promised and I will bring you home again. 
For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They are plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Sound familiar? Yeah. But context, context, context. Think. <laughs> Think before you share. Think carefully here, right? In those days, verse, if you keep reading, verse 12 will say, in those days, when you pray, then I will listen. Think about it, right? So think about being my age, right? <laughs> You're not 20 years old or something like that. I'm not listening to you now. You're going to go away in exile, right? So you've just been defeated. You're going to experience horrible atrocities, and you're going to go into exile, and you're going to get stuck in that place, not your native land, for 70 years. And it's in Babylon. So guess what? You can't worship God there. Think about it. You can't go to church anymore. None of it. You're gone. 70 years. And unless you're like 20, what the plans I pro what? You're not going to see those plans. You're going to die. That's what's going to happen because it's 70 years. So basically, barely anyone listening to this is going to see that prosperity. What's really being said here is, I'm punishing you all corporately, and then when you're done with the big time out and die, I will reward your ancestors corporately. It's not about you. So first of all, you're not in captivity in Babylon, right? <laughs> That's not you, right? You're not experiencing that stuff. Stop it. Like, no, no, no. You're not in chains and naked and everything, being beaten. No, it's not about you. It's not even about the people <laughs> he's writing to for the most part. They're not going to see it. So you see the, the backdrop here? And then when you use it, if someone knows a story, right, they're like that person on the plane, like, God, it sounds crazy. It sounds like crazy people. So not about you. And furthermore, if you look wholeheartedly, then, <laughs> then you may get it. And to the people... Who wouldn't listen? I will send war, famine, and disease upon them, and I'll make them like the bad figs, too rotten to eat. Again, <laughs> and you who are in exile, it continues, you haven't listened either. You haven't listened. He's putting them in the group. <laughs> Forget it. You're all bad figs. That's why you're getting the punishment. I have to punish you. Again, with the false teachers. Don't let these false teachers take my word <laughs> and use it wrongly. They're lying to you. you got to take the punishment. That's what it's all about. Now, again, another earmuffs warning. <laughs> all right? So kids, if there's kids in the kids' room, I would just turn the volume off for a minute. Um, earmuffs warning. We have a kids' ministry, so yeah, be in there. So just a little bit scary here. So I've made my case. I think at this point, like the defense can rest. It's really silly to be using that verse. <laughs> for like, I want a new job or a car. Like, no, 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 no. This is not what this is about, right? So it's already silly. It'll get worse. So it's so bad in these sieges and in this captivity, it's so bad that they resort to cannibalism. And they're told about it. Jeremiah 19.9 was predicted. I will see to it, this is the Lord, Speaking, I will see to it that your enemies lay siege to the city until all the food is gone. Those, then those trapped inside will eat their own sons and daughters and friends. They will even be driven to utter despair. Just stop and think about doing that. Seriously? That's crazy. Also, another book, Lamentations. It's at the end. So after Jeremiah, there are naturally laments. Right? You're sad. You're singing very sad songs. It's bad. Two times in that short five-chapter book, it's kind of like the Psalms, but real sad. Two times it talks about this. End of chapter 2 and 4, where it says, Lamentations 4.10, Tender-hearted women have cooked their own children. They have eaten them to survive the siege. That's in your Bibles, people. And so, you know, you're not going to put that verse out, right? And then take the coffee cup, I love Jesus, and like get the picture with your pencil, you know, because I study my Bible, right? That, that, yeah, nope, that's not going to be the section. That's not a verse of the day. I haven't seen that one come up, <laughs> you know? So it's crazy. So it's really, really bad. Now, here's the thing. I want to tie some stuff together here because we're going to go back. We saw this already, and some of you might not remember it. So I'm going to give you a little background here. We're going to go to Deuteronomy, 
and we're going to go to Moses. And at the end of Deuteronomy, it says that he was a prophet. He's somebody who speaks on behalf of the Lord. He's a prophet. It calls him a prophet, just with that in mind, like Jeremiah. Now, if we go back, we kind of see a funny section. And it's this ritual that they're going to have to do. There's all these different things that they're going to have to do when they get to the promised land. So again, right, it's not 70 years, but 40 years. They're going to wander around right, a year for each day that they scouted out the land, and then they were disobedient. They're too afraid to go into it. So fine, you're afraid to go into it, 40 years. They're going to wander around the desert. He's going to provide the manna for them, and some quail sometimes when they complain. Right? And that then, then, same type of situation, then you're going to get to the promised land, and you're going to do all this stuff. And one of the weird things they're going to do is they're going to go up on two mountains, half the tribes one, half the tribes on the other, Gerizim and Ebal. And they're going to go on these mountains. Half the tribes are going to pronounce a curse over them for not obeying the law. If you don't obey God's law, curses on you. Then the other half, they're going to pronounce the blessings that you get if, in the rare occasion, you actually obey, which is why, if you look at chapter 27, it's all curses. <laughs> chapter 28, just the top of it, I think the first 14 or so verses of it are the blessings. But then, 15 through 60, 68, 68 curses. <laughs> so tons of curses on them. Why? Why are there so many curses? Because they're not going to obey. That's the prophecy. Moses knows that. So the Lord tells them, they're not going to obey me. So these are all the curses they're going to get. Now, here's the funny thing. I once had somebody think they were really smart. And they're like, Gene, you know, we're always to be blessed. And, you know, God just always wants us to be happy all the time and never punish us or anything, even though, like, there's huge things about it. And Jesus says so, too. And so does Paul, Peter, James, John. Everybody says it, right? But they don't want it. Nope, nope, nope. That doesn't apply to me at all. You know, I'm just going to get the blessings. And so what did this individual do. I didn't like add what I was going to say about him. What did he do? <laughs> he quoted Deuteronomy 28 as his proof text. I was like, well, I didn't answer him. Like I had nothing to say. I'm like, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it. This guy's crazy. Are you re you're, you're really using that as like your blessings verse. So try to like argue with me. Like dude didn't even read the rest of the page, you know, where it's horrible. And I want to show you this. This is what it says. In the midst of this text, Deuteronomy 28, 53, the siege, ah, that's going to happen because you're disobedient, and terrible distress of the enemy's attack will be so severe that you will eat the flesh of your own sons and daughters, whom the Lord God has given to you. The most tender-hearted man among you will have no compassion for his own brother, his beloved wife, and his surviving children. He will refuse to share with them the flesh he's devouring, the flesh of his own children, because he has nothing to eat during the siege and terrible distress that your enemy will inflict on your towns. The most tender and delicate woman among you, so delicate, she would not so much as touch the ground with her foot, will be selfish toward the husband she loves and toward her own son or daughter. She will hide from them the afterbirth and the new baby she has born, so that she herself can secretly eat them. She will have nothing else to eat during the siege and terrible distress that your enemy will inflict on your towns. And that's the rest of the story. Think about that for a second. And I didn't know the Bible said that. Yes, <laughs> it does, right? So don't ever use 2911 about your job ever again. <laughs> I don't want to hear it because that's all the stuff that comes in my head when you people do that. I'm like, oh, that is distasteful. <laughs> it's distasteful. The pun was not intended. That was bad. <laughs> I just, I accidentally, I accidentally, I joke so much, I accidentally joke. <laughs> like it's terrible, sorry. Okay. But anyway, and it's the same thing. Moses, it, it's horrible, right? He takes him up, up on the mountain, and he's like, look, Moses, he's about to die. Look, that's the promised land. Isn't it awesome? You're not going to get to see it. That's what happens to him. You're not going to get to see it. Your people all sinned, and by the way, he couldn't keep them in control. So that's it. So again, it's one of those not you, not now, not yet <laughs> sections of Scripture. So it's a prophetic picture of the future. Like Jeremiah 29, same thing in Deuteronomy. It's surrounded by great tragedy and distress. It's not a good time. It's horrible. You see, the Bible isn't short-sighted. 
like these false teachers are, right? So the crux of the false teaching is, you know, here, now, immediate, now, immediately. I want it now, right? So right, they, they fit perfectly in to the next generation. Everything's got to be immediate, now, fast. Me, 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 me. <laughs> when Jesus says, die, 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 die. Like, that's got to go. The me, 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 none of that. That is not Christian speak. Me, 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 me. No, and Jesus tells us, Jesus washes feet. <laughs> you know, what? Yeah, then how much more should you do? It's not about you. But people don't want to hear that. So for those who are new here, <clears throat> there's a thing called the prosperity gospel. That's, that's a thing. And I'll show you both sides of the coin, but that's a big thing. Basically, like anything else here in America, Christianity has been commercialized horribly. Absolutely horribly. Just, just, it's terrible, right? So when we think of like the masses, right? You know, it's it, the mainstream. You think about mainstream anything, you know, it's probably not true. Well, mainstream Christianity, same thing. You got a lot of people suiting up, trying to look their best on a Sunday, and then as soon as they get out the door, they're not being anything like Jesus at all. And that's what's going on. That's it. But if you don't call out sin, you don't talk about people eating their children. Right? <laughs> you know, if you don't preach, like, as you can see, huge portions of the Bible, well, these people are going to like that, right? Because we've made it commercially palatable, not a pun. And, and, and so we just fed them, spoon fed them, not another pun. I can't stop. And so that, that's, <laughs> that's what they do, right? So we get that. We get that in everything else. But it can't be in Christianity. Really? The Bible talks about it. It's going to happen, it says. I read that to you recently, right, in 2 Timothy. In these times, well, what? The false teachers are going to what? Flourish, you know? And then real Christians are going to what? Suffer. That's what it says all over the place. So they preach this here now, and they prey on short-sightedness and ignorance. That's what they're doing. They're not going to read you any of that stuff. You're going to hear that. So there are many who will use... Jeremiah, right, to just claim these blessings. And now you can see, I hope I educated you into, how just, like, disrespectful and ignorant that is. It's crazy. You know, imagine taking a line out of, like, some horrible Holocaust movie and then using it like, oh, yeah, man, you know, you're going to be rich. What? Like, are you aware of what these people went through? And now that you are, well, what are you going to do about it? You know, have some respect. It's disrespectful, and especially to claim it on some shallow material thing that you can survive without. And you got plenty of food, by the way. You know, it's, it's just crazy. It, it misses the point. Now, a quick disclaimer here. God gives. There's nothing wrong with having stuff. Nothing. Nothing. Both sides of the coin. There's no, God will bless us sometimes. He will give. He can do that. But the Bible also says you will suffer sometimes. But you will be blessed sometimes. Right? So back and forth, it's okay. The Bible says clearly we'll prosper in some occasions. And it says clearly we'll suffer in some occasions. We've got to deal with both things. It's not one or the other. It's both, depending on the Lord's timing. And we don't know what that is all the time. So here's the thing. If you have stuff, the important point is don't be greedy with it and don't be a slave to it. That's it. So it's the health and wealth gospel. <clears throat> so if we go to places like First and Second Timothy, if we go to First Timothy, we see there's a warning about it. First Timothy 6 in particular. And he says, hey, look, tell the rich people to what? You know, be generous. How do you think the churches started? How do you think they supported these people? They need some benefactors to help them out. So he's not like, Timothy, chase them away and tell them to sell everything or they're going to hell. No. Be really generous. We see this in James 2. There are rich people in the church, and they keep telling them the same thing. Be really generous. Don't be a slave to that money. But he tells Timothy, flee from those things. We'll be good with food and clothing. That's it. I want Timothy playing with that fire because he knows it's, it's dangerous. It's very dangerous. So, Jesus, think about this. The parable of the sower. He teaches that what, what chokes out the plant from growing up? 
Wealth. <laughs> Wealth can just choke out God's word from your life. He warns about it. See, the danger of prosperity is simple. It binds us to the world. Prosperity can lead us to think that we found our place in the world. But in reality, the world has found its place in us. Not good. The point from Moses to Jehoiachin, where we are today, is that God is enough. He's able, but he's enough. So, if we go to the best commentary we have on the Old Testament, the New Testament, <laughs> we see some interesting things. So I explained this to you in the past really, really quick. You can't be a New Testament Christian. Sorry, eh, wrong. Can't do it. Why? Because 33%-ish of the New Testament is Old Testament quotes or paraphrase. Can't do it. Right? So, and if you don't read the Old Testament, you have no idea, again, what you're talking about or what these people are referencing or the context behind it. So you don't even understand the New Testament if you don't know the Old. And for as much as Jeremiah 29.11 is quoted by Christians today in the church, it is not quoted at all in the New Testament. Not once. But you know what it is? Jeremiah 12 in James. So we look at James. I gave you some of the context. A real problem in the book of James for that church is there are a lot of wealthy people in it, but the problem is they're not being generous. Right? So they're treating the poor people unfairly. You know, they're saying, oh, well, I'm going to sit up here in the prominent seats and you, you go sit in the back or whatever because you're poor. So that's the context of what's going on. So he's a little harsh with them, but listen to it. James 5.1, look here, you rich people. Weep and groan with anguish because of all the terrible troubles ahead of you. Your wealth is rotting away and your fine clothes are moth-eaten rags. Your gold and silver are corroded. The very wealth you are counting on will eat away your flesh like fire. This corroded treasure you have hoarded will testify against you on the day of judgment. Yeah, they're going to be judged. For listen... Hear the cries of the field workers whom you have cheated of their pay. The cries of those you, who harvest your fields have reached the ears of the Lord of heaven's armies. You have spent your years on earth in luxury, satisfying your every desire. You have fattened yourselves for the day of slaughter. Jeremiah 5.5, 5, or sorry, James 5.5 5 is a reference to Jeremiah 12, 2 through 3. Lord, you always give me justice when I bring my case before you. So let me bring you this complaint. Why are the wicked so prosperous? Why are evil people so happy? You have planted them, and they've taken up root and prospered. Your name is on their lips, but you are far from their hearts. The lip service. But as for me, Lord, you know my heart. You see me and test my thoughts. Drag these people away like sheep to be butchered. Set them aside to be slaughtered. They're prosperous here, but what happens? Gone. Gone. So what he's saying, if you go back to chapter 1, I'm not going to put all the verses on the screen. We're going to come to a close here. The problem is, is that their loyalty is divided between the world and God. One foot in, one foot out. That's a problem for God. He does not want half of you. He wants all of you. They will fade away, the rich people and all their stuff, like a flower in the field. We can have wealth, but be sure to do the right thing with it. It's important. You mustn't have divided loyalty. Yet there are so many who just don't get it. And this is so repetitive. This is a topic where it's hard for me to pick verses. I started the message, it has like all verses, and it was like two hours long. That's how repetitive this is. It's repetitive. But you know who got it? Paul. Just a quick recap. Read Philippians, a little homework. There's another verse in there that I don't like. <laughs> 4 through 10. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Yeah, you can endure in prison like Paul and be tortured. You can do all things all right. But if you read the whole thing, he talks about suffering for Christ and the necessity of that, the expectation of his suffering. He says you should expect to join Christ in his suffering. You know what he says, though? It's interesting, and I did this a couple weeks ago. Just be quick. He's in prison. He thinks he could die, and he's like, you know, that would be much better to just die and go home and be with the Lord. Now, think about it. He's a believer. So he's like, heaven sounds pretty nice right now. But for your sake, I'll stick around a little bit longer. For me, dying is game. This is his mindset. It's the mindset of a real believer. I just cannot wait to be with you, Lord. Makes sense, right, if we're calling ourselves Christians. 
He doesn't want to stick around. He's got the right attitude. And then you have the poem about Jesus. Take on Jesus. Make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus, right? And I recited that for you. That's, that's the point. And he makes the point that, listen, we're citizens of heaven, not here. Twice in that letter, we're citizens of heaven. He makes it after the contrast of the false teachers, warning about false teachers. He says their God is their belly. All right? So they're enemies of the cross of Christ. Why? Because of their greed. That's the reason. And then he tells them, but uh-uh, we're not citizens here. We're citizens of heaven. Don't worry about that stuff. Don't believe them. That's it. Life here is temporary. Think about it. If you believe in heaven, you believe in, ter- in eternal life, why try to manufacture a counterfeit version here? What's the point? I call this kind of like false gospel, the sandcastle gospel. It's silly. You're just building something up that's just going to, God's going to sweep away. If you know this whole story, it's gone. So here's the perspective. Think of it like vacation. If you go on vacation, you don't plan on staying there. Well, we did that, right? So we came to Naples on vacation. We're like, we're staying. So I just blew up my whole illustration. (laughs) Yeah, I didn't think that one through. But anyway, you get my point, right? You go on vacation somewhere. I'm not going to live at Disney. I'd love to do that, like live in the castle or something. That would be like my wife's dream. You know, we get to live. But I keep telling her, it's noisy. There's all these people outside yelling and kids. So it's not like a 55-plus retirement community, right? So it's not quiet. Bad place to live. But we don't stay there. But what do we do when we're there? We have a good time, right? So when we're on vacation, we have a good time. But it's not permanent. So we'll go to the beach. We'll make a sandcastle. But we know somebody's going to kick it down, right? Or the wave's going to wash it away. It's not permanent. But we have a good time. You see both? We can do both things. So you don't go on the vacation and go, we're going to have to go back home. That's my dad. My dad, that's it. You can't take him anywhere. You're just like, we got to go back home. You know? I'm like, we just got here. You know what I mean? But some people live their lives like that, and that's terrible. Right? Here's another one. You're going to be with Jesus. Thank goodness, Dad. Maybe you'll be happy. He's complaining to Jesus about something. There's something not right with heaven. Some people are like that. We don't want to be like that. We talked about the curmudgeon. No, no, no. We want to have a good time, but this is vacation. We're just passing through. And then it's going to be over, right? we got to deal with it. So <clears throat> this is what Jesus says if you read the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7. Don't interrupt Jesus. Don't stop reading. Read 5 all the way through 7. Otherwise, what you're doing is you're like, Jesus, shut up for a minute. i got to do something more important. No, no, no. All the way through. It's meant to be heard or read all the way through, all three chapters. It's a sermon. Take you about a half hour. I think you can deal with it. But he says some important things. He starts with the famous Beatitudes. And what does he say? What's the first thing he says? Blessed are the poor. Blessed are the poor. Luke, Sermon on the Plain, probably says the same stuff, but different variation. It's a little different. But he goes on to the woes. So this is like Luke 6, verse 20 and 24, 5. Right? Woe to you who are rich. You've had your happiness now. That's it, right? So if you've hoarded all this stuff, you see poor people, whatever it is, you're not generous, you're not supporting your church, you're not doing anything with the money, or you're just taking like a little bit, and here's my leftovers, woe to you. You've had all the happiness you're ever going to get. That's it. It's bad. Well, the end of the Sermon on the Mount, I want to mention, Matthew 6, right? Store your treasure where? In heaven, where the moths and rust can't get it. Not here. But check out the way he ends as we kind of come to a close here. Matthew 7, 24. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey, obey, is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rains and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. And he drops the mic. That's it. That's the end of the sermon. Important point. That rock is Christ. Everything is built upon that rock. Nothing else. As we discussed last week, we must not put our faith in anything in the world. It will all fade away. What happens? Have you seen people through all this stuff? What happens when they put their faith in the government? 
they lose their minds. We've lost people from the church. <laughs> they like actually became affiliates with these political organizations over their Christianity. That's what happens. You fall away. It's sad. You can't put your faith in anything in this world. Nothing. There's nothing in this world that it can offer you that is better than what God has right now for you and in the future for you, even if it's a bad vacation. Nothing. In Christ and Christ alone, no buts. That's it. If you really believe in heaven, you really believe in this, why don't you have all your hope in eternal life? It's going to be better. So as we close, I want to look at Hebrews again. If you know Hebrews really well, <clears throat> when you get to chapter 8, the author of preacher Hebrews is quoting a really large section of Jeremiah 31. Jeremiah 31. Because if we go past 20, we see again and again, the hope is in eternity. It's in the future. Hope isn't right here and now. It's in the future. That's where our hope lies. There will be a new covenant. God will write his law on our hearts. We won't need the law of Moses anymore. All those curses, they're gone. It's our new covenant in Christ. And if we keep reading, we ended with Hebrews 10. Remember? Remember when you were on fire for Jesus? Stay that way. Remember when everything you had, this is what's happening to these people, was taken away from you. All, everything. So what are we going to do, Pastor Gene? What, what if they take our stuff? Hebrews, you accepted it with joy. That's what the word of God says. You accepted it with joy. Why? Hebrews 10, read it for yourself. Because you knew there were better things waiting in heaven for you. Who cares? I get to go to heaven. And we talked about this. Pity those people. Pity them. That's scary what awaits them, right? So we should have hearts of mercy and love for people, even if they're attacking us. Gosh, you're torturing me, you're imprisoning. This is what's happening to these people. But they're thinking, if they're thinking like Paul, uh, he's trying to get the prison guards to convert because he knows, like, there's nothing you can do to me that's worse than what God is going to do to you. Mercy, pity them, pray for them. It's going to be bad. There are better things waiting ahead. So that's my encouragement to you this morning. I'd like to pray for you. Lord, I thank you for everyone who came, everyone tuning in and watching online. We pray for, we have a lot of people traveling right now. So bless them, give them traveling mercies. But Lord, I pray that just our focus is on you, whether we're in prosperity or we're in pain. Regardless of the circumstance, the only place we turn is to you. And that we act as vehicles of your grace, your mercy, your patience, your kindness, your love, your goodness, and your self-control. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.